Hello everyone and welcome to Team 2's Senior Design Project, a chemical plant design project converting toluene into p-xylene. So today we're going to talk about the problem that we were given. We're going to start with that, move on to our approach on how to handle the problem with our chemical plant, and then finally provide recommendations on to whether construct this plant or not. So. Our sponsor, Knitline Chemicals, charged us, Team 2, with designing and evaluating the economic viability of a chemical plant. They began by giving us a location, Houston, Texas, by the Gulf Coast. They gave us the years of operation. The plant was to be built by the year 2023 and stop operation in the year 2037. And finally, they gave us what we had to work with, a toluene stream, about 38,100 pounds per hour, and a hydrogen stream with the following components inside. So. With these streams, they also gave us a new catalyst, a zeolite catalyst, with the ability to produce p-xylene and benzene from toluene. Um, this is the reaction you can see to here. Uh, toluene produces mixed xylenes and benzene at a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, didn't give us too much information about the catalyst, so we noted that by saying it was a magic catalyst, and here's our magic wand to show that. Some additional reactions we had to worry about were toluene hydroalkylation, as well as xylene disproportionation. These are reactions that we attempted to avoid as much as possible. So as far as p-xylene goes, um, it is actually exclusively produces p-xylene, the reactor. However, there is an isomerization reaction in which p-xylene is also converted in smaller amounts to m-xylene and o-xylene. The reason that we want p-xylene is actually used extensively in industry. Um, first and foremost, it's used in polyester, such as t-shirts. It's additionally used in plastic components, such as water bottles. So we were given several specifications to meet uh, in this project, as well as costs and revenue streams. Uh, the specifications were a few of them. Number one was uh, in the reactor. Uh, there actually had to be a two to one ratio of hydrogen to toluene in terms of moles. Additionally, we had a minimum recovery of p-xylene percentage and benzene percentage of 85%. And finally, uh, we had to minimize our loss of toluene and benzene, as well as p-xylene, to less than 3% of the initial toluene feed. So how are we going to do this project? Uh, we're going to talk about some cost drivers. Um, so there's capital costs, including material, labor, out-of-bound limits, as well as annual costs, such as catalysts and utilities. Those occur every year. And then uh, we also have revenue drivers, so how are we going to make our money? And that's generally by selling our p-xylene and our benzene. So here to talk about the next section, the reactor, is my friend Addison Fowler. Uh, I'm going to be discussing the conditions that we were provided with as well as what we, how we dealt with them with regards to the reactor. So the reactor is the most important aspect of a chemical production facility because it actually creates the product. So we were given constraints with regard to this reactor, specifically the partial pressure of hydrogen in the process, as well as some pilot data with regard to the, the temperatures and the perizylene selectivity and other selectivities and conversion with re with regard to temperature, as well as the cost of the catalyst, and we had to balance out all those variables. So, in order to do that, we compared the perizylene selectivity um, with the reactor temperature, or we coordinated them, as well as the toluene conversion with regard to reactor temperature, and one was a trade-off of the other, and so we determined that there was a, a specific zone of maximizing the perizylene selectivity um, with the conversion, and we have that mapped out here. So we, this is the sweet spot right here with regard to maximizing the production as well as the perizylene selectivity. So with that, we found that a w, uh, WHSV of 1.8 as well as a temperature of 630 led to maximal results with regard to perizylene production. And with that, I'll turn it over to my friend Kristen, who will discuss the BFD. So I'm going to quick go over what we actually decided to do for our plant process. One of the two things we were given was the toluene feed and the fact that we were going to have a fresh hydrogen feed coming into our plant. For the reactor to work, everything needs to be in the vapor phase. Therefore, we had to have a reactor feed preparation process in which we made both streams up to 630 degrees Fahrenheit and at a pressure of 386 PSIA. After the reactor, it goes into a flash distillation system in which it takes off the hydrogen and methane from the liquid. The hydrogen and methane then goes to a pressure swing adsorption unit in which it separates 
the hydrogen from the methane. The methane goes to a flare while the hydrogen goes back into the recycle so we don't have to buy as much fresh hydrogen as we would have otherwise. The rest of the liquid from the flash distillation unit goes into a, our first distillation unit. From there, we are separating our benzene product. Our benzene had to be at least 99.9% .9 pure, but we went one step further and we got 99.98% purity. The rest of that went into our second distillation column in which we separated our toluene from the rest of the liquid. Toluene did not need a specific purity level, but we did try to get this as high as we possibly can. Our toluene is recycled back for, to, so it can go back through the reactor. We did have to put a split on there because if we recycled back all the toluene, we didn't get the purity that we needed for our products. From the distillation two column, we go to distillation three, and here it separates our mixed xylenes from TMB. Our mixed xylenes then go into our Perix unit to separate our P xylene from our O and M xylene. Our P xylene also had to be at least 99.9%, .9%, but we got up to 99.96%. Right here, I just wanted to show our overall material balance that we do have our P xylene coming out at 9,918 pound per hour, but again, this is based off of our material balance. Now I'm going to hand it off to Jay Wook. Uh, there's a two major costs for it, which is the capital cost and the operation, uh, operational cost. The capital cost is money that needs to be uh, required to purchase the equipment or the cost they require to develop a site. And for the operational cost, it includes the utilities such as electricity or cooling water that's being used, or it also, it also includes the uh, cost it required to purchase the raw material. And uh, let me talk about more details on the capital cost. Uh, this capital cost and operational cost can be divided into two different sections of the inside boundary limit and the outside boundary limit. Inside the boundary limit is pretty much the everything that goes the inside of the, our plant site. Uh, so all the utility equipment that's being inside of the unit considered as inside boundary limit. And on the other hand, outside boundary limit is everything that goes outside of the, our plants. Uh, and for the capital cost inside uh, IDL, the most of the spend is, uh, is from the separator. And the separator include flash distillation unit, parax unit, and then uh, pressure swing unit. And for the outside, uh, for the OBL cost, uh, most of OBL cost is from the uh, cooling water and the raw material tanks that are outside of the plant. And now, let me talk about operational cost. Uh, for the OBL and IBL utility, it can, uh, it can be summed up and uh, described on this uh, pie chart. Uh, this utility usually includes electrical power and all the steams, uh, pressure steam, including low pressure and medium pressure and high pressure, and it also including like cooling waters and natural gas. And for the utility, most of utility cost is from the electrical power of the 44%, and if I sum, it up, sum up all the utility costs, it is 11.85 cents per pound of our product. And there's another, uh, another major opera uh, operational cost is the raw material cost. Uh, as you see in this chart, the toluene is the, uh, toluene, toluene is the raw material that uh, cost most of the 94%. And when summing up all this raw material, co uh, raw material cost, it is 139.77 cents per pound product, which was very high value. And, um, and for, uh, for lastly, there is also IBL fixed cost that includes taxes and all the labor cost. And when summing up, when summing up it, it is uh, found to be around 16.24 cents per pound. Pro, uh, pounds product. So overall, if I sum up every uh, all the operation costs I was talking about, then uh, this uh, it results into this pie chart. As you see, in, as you see here, eighty six point six four percent was the from the raw material. It is because uh, toluene 
Uh, purchasing toluene costs very oh, a lot. So when I sum up all this cost uh, for our 15 year run of the operator, operation, operations cost could be approximately 686 million million dollar and capital cost will be 115 million dollar. And for the total of uh, total of cost uh, is approximately negative up. Uh, Eight hundred or one million dollar. Thank you very much, and I will hand it out to Dongju for the alternative case study. In this project, we created two alternative case study to check whether we could build a better design of our plan or not. The alternative case study was created on, based on their three assumption. First assumption was that the feed flow to the distillation column one for all three cases have s same conditions. The second assumption was that the operating cost for three cases were similar. Therefore, we ignore the operating cost when you actually calculate the profit. The last assumption is that the trade efficiency for distillation column three for our original case and the uh, case two was similar. In our alternative case study one, we removed the distillation column three from the original case. The reason for that is to check whether selling the TMB product actually makes reasonable profit. In our alternative case study two, we interchange the order of the column. We switch the parks and the distillation column series order. The reason for that is we found out from the original case that some of the parasailing product came out as a bottom product in distillation column three. To recover the maximum amount of the parasailing product, we switched the order to make sure to purify the parasailing product first. For the profit, we actually found out that uh, case one was actually detrimental. We lose around $7.1 million for our operating time, and we actually earn $0.68 million for our operating time. For the economic evaluation, we actually did the economic evaluation with cash flow for our case one. Therefore, we could say that our profit is actually reasonable. However, for case two, we didn't perform any economic evaluation. Therefore, further study is needed to make sure that our profit makes sense. And now I, mean, I will hand to Amanda. Okay. So based on the information we've just given you, Team 2 recommends not moving forward with the production of the plant based on these numbers. So here we see a pie chart where 78% of the costs are in the raw materials and byproducts. Even with the saleable byproducts offsetting the raw materials, we still have not made enough money to make this plant viable. To see if we could make the plant viable, we did some sensitivity analyses to, to analyze. So we started with capital costs. Here, we increased or decreased our capital costs by 5%. And this could easily change within our plant based on inaccurate quotes or other changes throughout the project. Our best case here would be to decrease our capital costs by 5%, but we are still have such a negative cash flow that our plant is not viable. Next, we analyzed whether a change in schedule could change our profit viability. So here, we changed our schedule to be either behind or ahead of schedule by one year. In both cases, we would still be finishing in the year 2037, but our startup year would be different. Here, our best case would be if we were behind schedule. Because our plant is losing money every year, the best case would be for us to operate one less year. So next, we analyze the utility costs. Here, we increased or decreased our costs by 5%. This could easily change based on fluctuations in the market and changes in the price of natural gas, which is our basis for calculating all of our utility costs. Here, our best case would be, again, if we decreased our utility costs by 5%, but this still did not de make our cash flow positive enough, or positive at all, enough to make our plant viable. Finally, we studied fixed costs. So here, we decreased or increased our fixed costs by 5%, but this still did not make our plant viable. Fixed costs could change based on changes in the market or changes in regulatory requirements, meaning our insurance or labor rates could change. So here, by decreasing our fixed costs by 5%, our cash flow is still quite negative, meaning that our plant is not viable. So based on our analyses, none of the options we explored yielded a favorable profit. There are some further things we could study, for example, decreasing the cost of toluene or the toluene usage, 
or studying the catalyst to see if we could optimize the reactions to produce more of our desired products. And based on this, our proposed plant is not viable. 